Hello. Hey, everyone. Sorry. We're going to get started here. Um, just want to say hello and welcome. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, it's been two years since we've had an in-person event at Hana House. Uh, it's actually, I think it was February 2020 when we had the last one. So it's a bit surreal to kind of see everyone in our space again after such a long time. And it really just warms my heart that we're able to do this again after two years. Um, so thank you again for coming out here and making the time on your St. Paddy's Day to join us for this special event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin Summerhauser. I'm the head of Hana House here in Palo Alto. I'm sure some of you might be new to Hana House, some of you might be returning, so welcome. Uh, if you're not super familiar with what Hana House is, uh, we are a flexible co-working space and cafe. Uh, we have this location we're at here tonight in Palo Alto. We also have one down south in Newport Beach. If you ever have a chance in, no in Newport Beach to go check out that space, it's unbelievable, right on the water, beautiful location. Uh, and what's really cool about Haunt House and kind of separates us from most other co-working spaces is that we're open to everyone in the community. Anyone who wants to use our space can use it. We don't do monthly membership costs. We don't do long-term commitment. Instead, we just offer you know, pay-by-the-hour workspace reservations, so you can just use the space based on your own needs. So, for example, I know some of you are probably sick and tired of your work-from-home environments, want to get outside the house. This is a spot to come do that. We are open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. We have Blue Bottle Coffee inside our building, serving some of the most delicious coffee I've ever had. Uh, and you can visit our website. It's hauntahouse.com. That's where you can see all of our workspace offerings. You can uh, see all of our events. You can make a profile in like less than two minutes and start making online reservations as early as tomorrow if you'd like. Um, so I definitely encourage you to come check out our space even outside of an event like this. Um, I'm here every day of the week almost. You can come up and say hi to me. And how about this? If you come up, say hi, you attended, I'll buy you a blue bottle coffee on my treat. <laughs> Yeah, and then, so outside of our co-working space, we do do these monthly events for the community. Um, and the reason why we do this is because we don't view ourselves as just a traditional co-working space. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm not sure how many of you guys know this, but uh, Hana House is a subsidiary of the global software company SAP. And we were first envisioned by the co-founder of SAP himself, Professor Dr. Hasso Plattner. And when he envisioned Hana House, he wanted to make it a place where people could come together share their ideas and knowledge, connect with other like-minded individuals, and really make this a place where the Silicon Valley community would naturally want to hang out. So that's exactly why we're doing events like this, and we've been waiting to do them for two long years, and I'm so excited that we're able to do this. And what better way to kick off the in-person event experience than what we have on deck tonight? We have two amazing speakers joining us this evening to talk about some very cool, very hot topics in tech and entrepreneurship. Um, and I don't want to dive too deep into their backgrounds. I'm sure you'll get to learn a little bit more about them throughout the discussion. But just as a brief intro, we have Chris Ye. He's a serial entrepreneur, co-founder of the Blitzscaling Academy, and a New York Times best-selling author. And believe it or not, he is a regular at Hana House during the, uh, you know, during the business hours <laughs> using our co-working space. That's how we've got to know him. And then we're also joined by CEO and founder of Immortal Studios, Peter Shao, who's joining us all the way from Southern California this evening to talk about his company, what he's doing to innovate, and his journey to building the next global storyverse. So without any other spoilers, why don't we give a big warm welcome and a big round of applause for Chris and Peter, and let's get this event kicked off tonight, yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colin. Oh my goodness. It is pretty incredible. Oh wait, wrong seat. This, this was not part of the script. Peter, P we, I asked Peter beforehand, which would you like? Would you like the, the far one or the near one? He said the far one. I'm like, that's perfect because I wanted the near one, but I completely forgot once I got on stage. I'm really out of practice in terms of being on stage. All right, so thank you so much for coming here tonight. As you heard, I'm Chris Shea. This is Peter Schau. What we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation first between us, but then really involving everyone in the room about Silicon Valley, Hollywood, some of the amazing stuff that Peter is working on. Uh, before we get started though, Peter, I think you have a video for us to watch. I Can do. you tell us a little bit about this video? Sure. Um, Immortal was born in the middle of the pandemic, and what I'm going to show to you guys is a, is, a, is a crowdfunding video that we came up with about a year ago 
that literally launched the company. So it goes into the backgrounds of a little bit about my personal history, a little bit about Immortal Studios. Uh, not so much in depth into, into our conversation tonight, which is how we're taking technology to, in, in partnering with content. But it's going to open up a, the conversation for us to di take a deeper dive. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and show that video. My earliest and fondest memories growing up is reading wuxia stories. These amazing martial arts fantasies, usually set in ancient China, about the journeys of martial heroes and heroines. You see, my dad was creating wuxia stories this entire time. In fact, he was already celebrated as one of the top creators of the genre all over the world. Chinese people knew him and celebrated him everywhere. But in America, no one knew him and knew very little of this world he created where people who looked like me and him were included and celebrated. Immersing myself deeper into his stories, I started to understand the aspirations behind them and the ability of the genre to empower and transform lives as it has for thousands of years. Over time, I felt a strong desire to share them with my world. My name is Peter Shao. I'm the founder and CEO of Immortal Studios. I'm also the son of Xiao Yi, the American Puma, one of the greatest voices of the wuxia genre. In fact, I'm sitting here today in the Xiao Yi library where many of his memorable works were created, even though my father passed away before fulfilling our dream to bring wuxia to the 21st century. The time has come for me to continue in this legacy. In Immortal Studios, we're bringing wuxia to the world in an elevated and empowering way, beginning with the 60 plus properties under the Xiao Yi library. We've already assembled a dream team of talent working this very minute to create an interconnected storyverse of characters and plot lines made for today's audiences. This storyverse is gonna bring together all the wide ranging influences from Kung Fu heroes to immortal swordsmen and promising a lifetime of content. Starting with graphic novels, which gives us the ability to build a fan base very cost effectively. From there to video, movies, television, games, even spawn a lifestyle. In short, we aim to reach, engage, and empower audiences in all media. We call this Awaken the Hero in All of Us. Martial arts and even wuxia have long been staples of Hollywood and Asian entertainment. It's also influenced great works such as Star Wars, The Matrix, Cobra Kai, the Marvel Universe, and John Wick. Believe it or not, this genre does not yet have a global home. Our first release, The Adept, is a story of redemption and homecoming about a modern woman being trained to be a hero in the Shaolin Kung Fu tradition. Her journey to bring her family back together with a pop star parallels competing martial clans and the unifying powers of Great Chi, the underlying energy of it all. So this is just the beginning. As I reawaken the hero within me to go on this immortal adventure, I want to invite you along. Will you awaken your hero too and come along? With your help, we can bring these stories back. We can write a new chapter in this timely genre. We can build a community that will awaken the Shah, the heroes, and all of us. Thank you. Now, Peter, let's start with this. You mentioned that this was a video that you put together for a crowdfunding campaign. Did you meet your goal? Yes, yes. We, we three times our goal. And what was the, what was, what was the project that you were funding? The, basically, the, the company of Mortal Studios. I, one of the things that I believe is unique in this moment is being able to directly engage your users. And I wanted to have this as somebody who's kind of operated in traditional Hollywood for a very long time and being very frustrated by it. I've always wanted to engage the, the public directly to see if we could actually blur the lines between your fans or your, your, your audience and the creative process. And I thought the, one of the best ways to do that is actually to have many, many shareholders. So I'm really proud of the fact that we have close to 1,000 uh, shareholders. And my goal is to bring that to a million over the next couple of years. Fantastic. 
So you mentioned Hollywood, which is an important place where this all starts. So many, not everyone knows this, but I grew up in Santa Monica, California, not far from Hollywood. Uh, grew up with the entertainment industry around me. My sister even worked on the productions of Baywatch and ER, for those of you who remember those television shows. So I've always been a big fan of the entertainment industry, but you have worked directly in the industry. Talk a little bit about your background. You mentioned it was a little frustrating, but what are some of the things that you did in the movie industry? Sure, well, I want to backtrack a little bit. When we talk about Hollywood and Silicon Valley, I'm actually, I consider myself a product of Hollywood, not just the industry, but the place. I actually grew up in Hollywood as an immigrant kid born in Taiwan, and I arrived in Hollywood as a 10-year-old. So I went to junior high school in Hollywood. I went to elementary school in Hollywood. I went to Hollywood High School. I probably tore up every inch of um, Hollywood Boulevard on my skateboard. So Hollywood is a place that's in my blood. But as a young immigrant kid, kind of not in the mainstream of Hollywood, Hollywood was this kind of place that was out there. I skateboarded by the, the major studios. I was on Hollywood Boulevard. I see all the handprints. So um, I never thought I would actually get to participate. So, um, you know, my, I started my career working in politics. So I had this, this epiphany that um, when I, at the time I was running the California State Senate Committee on the Entertainment Industry, that I actually wanted to be a creative. So I didn't know how I was going to make my way back to this place I grew up. So I quit politics and I jumped in uh, feet first. So the first thing that I did to get into the industry was I actually created a, a forum where um, policymakers, filmmakers, uh, studios from Hollywood and China would come together. And that proved to me my launching pad. So um, you know, I had, I had these ideas about stories and scripts. And um, the first idea that I had that I attached a writer to actually sold. And my second job, so I was like, wow, this is pretty easy. So I sold my first script. <laughs> the first script I ever developed was sold to the actor and director whom I designed it for. So I was like, well, I'm pretty good at this. The next stage was I got to produce my first movie um, as an independent producer. And that kind of launched my career. So since then, I've, um, I would say one of the seminal moments for me, a career-making moment, was partnering with one of my idols, Marlon Brando, and becoming business part partners with Marlon, um, which led me to being mentored by a really seminal, I call him my Jewish godfather, Mike Medavoy, who's one of the seminal figures, uh, probably one of the most successful producers in Hollywood. I saw him lose about a billion dollars in, um, in a very short amount of time, which gave me a sense of, so I, um, I embarked on a career which kind of earned, my, earned me the right to be here. So I, I was uh, an independent producer. And my painful lesson in launching my first movie, a, a movie that I loved, that I co-wrote, I produced, very proud of. And it lost a lot of money, because not because the movie wasn't made well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't distributed well. And that's when I really started to think, like, how can we actually, um, it didn't make sense. The movie business didn't make sense. So, and. Before I would be given the, the chance to run my own studio, I knew I had to train myself in all aspects of the industry. So I learned to, um, how film financing worked. I ran my own film fund. Um, I wanted to get into technology, so I really spent a lot of time looking at interactive technologies. And I looked at transmedia. How do you take content and you migrate them from different platforms? Um, I spent a lot of time cutting my teeth on art in creative development, and of course, um, all aspects of technology. And this is one of the things I think is interesting about the comparison and contrast of Silicon Valley and Hollywood, right? There's not a particular path that you have to follow in Silicon Valley. Famously, we have dropouts running the world's most valuable companies. There's no particular background you have to have. And I think much of the same in Hollywood. I think anybody who's seen the movie Licorice Pizza recently knows that Peter Goober, the, the former super producer, is in that. I believe he actually mm -hmm. partially owns the Warriors. And he was a hairdresser and started dating Barbara Streisand, which, again, I'm not John saying. John Peters. John Peters, that's yes. it. John Peters is his partner. And so there is no set path. There's not, it's not like you had to have gone to school studying film production at USC in order to do this. 
So how did you, how did you find the various places? How did you find those various skills to come together? It was hard. It was hard because I, I am considered in Hollywood an independent person. I, I, a maverick of sorts. So I didn't go the traditional route. I've always eschewed um, going into the Hollywood system because I didn't see it as a place that was innovative. Mm -hmm. And because I had some social goals in mind going into Hollywood, I didn't just want to be in the business. I wanted to ultimately tell the stories that were important to me that I wanted. That was the reason I, why, why I joined. And, and I very quickly learned, very quickly learned that, um, yes, I was, I was admitted to Hollywood. I was given a chance to be a senior executive and actually make big movies happen. But there was a, there was a big caveat, which is as long as I didn't want to advocate for the movies that included people who looked like me, and my, my, my Chinese American Asian identity is a big part of why I wanted, wanted to tell these stories. And um, when I realized that was not part of the opportunity, I realized I, I had to basically create my own system yeah. outside of Hollywood. Well, let's talk about that representation for a second, because I remember when I was growing up, there would be times when we would say, literally, there were more aliens on network television than Asian Americans on network television, right? Either Alf was huge, for example. Yeah. There's plenty of other aliens. It we did have Hop Singh, though, from Bonanza, who's a very seminal. There you go. <laughs> But so talk to me about, obviously the idea of representation is really important to you. Talk to me about what you hope to accomplish in terms of representation. Well, I think when you look at global screens, because first of all, Hollywood is, kind of, is, is the global um, pop cultural capital of the world. So what happens in Hollywood becomes instantaneously recognized as truth and fact. So people do have this experience when you're watching a Hollywood film or any kind of content, this depicts reality. Um, just watching what happens on screen, you wouldn't know that the world is 60% Asian, you know, which is kind of, a, it's kind of an interesting fact. Mm -hmm. So it's not just really the representation, but I think when that happens, there's values and there's aesthetics. There's a lot of things that go into it that are not fully represented in the public square. So it's not really just to serve my own interest, but I do think that the world is too aggro right now and having an east-west orientation actually balances global culture. So it's really that balance that I was really very interested in devoting myself to. Now there is a, I'll play devil's advocate for a second. I think we're seeing that mainstream Hollywood is starting to take representation more seriously than it did in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, Disney, Pic Disney, Pixar just released Turning Red. Which That's is part of it is because millennials and Gen Y, Gen Z are demanding it. Mm -hmm. so, so our younger generation, are, they're coming up, and those are values they live and die by. And uh, the content industries are always going to be driven by youth-leaning youth audiences. And so I think we have a new social conscience and consciousness right now. Um, and they are changing the world. Yeah. And, and, and I do think... We do, have a, we do have an evolving moray, and it's really this amazing moment. Um, but importantly, ultimately, it's not about yellow, black, or white. It's about green. The world is 60% Asian. Hollywood is deriving most of its revenues from the globalization of Hollywood. So it is about green. Well, speaking of green, how about if you walk us through a little bit about Immortal Studios? We heard some of it in the video. But talk to us about what you're trying to do. What's your vision for Immortal Studios? Sure. Um, first of all, I wanted, I wanted to share more art and, and creativity of this. And maybe we'll, we'll start. Do we have it? Uh, yes, you should be able to hit the clicker at any point in time. So we, we distilled down what is this promise of this wuxia. And I, I think I referenced it a little bit in, in, this, um, in this video here. Wuxia literally means the martial hero genre. This is a very, very uh, timely genre that's been around for thousands of years. And it's persisted and it's been workshopped and it's, it's existed because it awakens heroes, especially during very, very troubling, challenging times. So my, 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 my thesis is that this, during this time of global crises, that everybody is looking for stories and storytelling that is aspirational and empowering and transformational. So my belief is that the opportunity for this genre that has been workshop for thousands of years, this time has come, and we got it down to a simple message, which is to awaken the hero in everybody. Big green button.
What am I pointing toward? Here, uh, you should be able to point anywhere, but you should just be able to hit the big green button. Ooh, maybe not. We should check on that just for a second. But meanwhile, we'll, while that's while we're clearing up that, so technology. we have this thousands of we have this thousands of year, years of history, um, and the most successful companies in Hollywood today, whether you're thinking of Marvel or you're thinking of Pixar, are really brands that represent a psychographic and a demographic. And interestingly enough, the only global popular genre that's come out of East Asia uh, does not yet have a permanent home. So part of our thinking was to build this permanent home for Wuxia and all these different machinations of it. So this is, this is a little visual we did, and this is our positioning. We are, we are representing this martial hero genre in this place called Hollywood. We believe it's got the, it's, it has the chops to be the industry-defining engine. And if you look at the data points, if you look at those of you with kids um, in, their, in their teens and their 20s, you would know this to be true, that anime is cleaning everybody's clock right now. Anime, which is essentially the action fantasy wing of the wuxia genre, as, is, as um, interpreted by Japan, it's actually trending right now to be the world's largest consumer um, kind of uh, IP engagement engine. We talked about the storied histories of this. Our view is that since taking possession of my father's library and becoming the creator myself, we now have a, one of the world's best premier uh, martial arts fantasy libraries all, in all rights. We're essentially building two businesses from these, a subscription-based business and a premium content business where movies, television, and games. Uh, that sounds like a billion-dollar investment, but I think the whole world cracked open for us when we finally settled on an MVP approach, which is essentially taking prototyping and using graphic comics, digital graphic comics, which could be produced pretty cost-effectively. You can render in semi-real time. You can actually make endless uh, adjustments. So I'm essentially saying this is an MVP. This is a minimum viable product. So I think our whole horizon changed when we realized that we can we could actually MVP everything that we're going to do in future iterations initially in this very cost-effective, fast approach. And this is essentially our business model. How did this idea come to you? Because obviously, I don't think this is the traditional Hollywood approach. You're obviously thinking outside the traditional it, boundaries. It is. I, I think as a, as a Hollywood producer, I was always frustrated with the lack of intelligence. Like we would we would pay so many so so like millions of dollars every year in writing scripts that never no one ever read. It was always like this screenwriter and this executive or this producer thinking they have, they're trying to, you know, it's based on everybody's good taste as opposed to actual engagement from your end users. So we wanted to break that model because it clearly doesn't work. You know, the adage of Hollywood, uh, according to, to, to the uh, longtime practitioners, is that nobody knows anything. You know, the collective wisdom of Hollywood after 100 years and I agreed, by the way, that nobody knows anything. But I would say tonight, starting, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out something new, is that that is no longer true because of big data, because of engagement, because of metrics, because of things that have been developed in this town married to this kind of very, very subjective world. It's no longer true that nobody knows everything. No, nobody knows anything. In fact, if you do it the right way, we're designing a system where we do know a lot. So this is the kind of IP we're dealing with. And here's a picture of my dad. And, and by the way, I'm, we're, we're celebrating this because this, the Xiaoyi Wuxia Library has just been established at UCLA. And I just got the notice on the way here, so. Congratulations, wow. So it, it, it's, it's an enormous honor to be handed the keys to my father's work and then also joining his footsteps now as a creator. Um, this is the story verse. This is the coolest part of it. And um, we're basically going back into this ancient tradition and say, what's new and what's different about this? So first of all, we decided that, that the best parts of the genre does not happen in ancient China. It actually happens in our world today with the challenges and the opportunities, the problems um, of today as the, as the primary backdrop. So we're taking this ancient genre and making it modern day. We're also making it multi-ethnic so that it's something that everybody can get behind. In our world, there are no radioactive spiders. 
that our superheroes are driven by people who cultivate themselves, who work with their own energy and become the heroes, unique heroes that they're intended to be. So it's a very, very empowering uh, democratize. Yes, something like that, but more breath. We're also, we're also going back into the transformational roots of the genre, which is ultimately very spiritual. So um, quantum physics has a large role to play in our version, what we call essential wuxia. So this is going to, so whether you're a long-term wuxia fan and you like the Once Upon a Time in China movies or Bruce Lee movies, we've actually brought together all the various influences from Bruce Lee to, um, to the Monkey King under one roof in an interconnected way. This has never happened before. So we've created four pillars. Uh, the beginning pillar is where the karate kid would live. The second pillar is where crouching tiger, hidden dragon would live. The third pillar, the immortal swordsman, is where the matrix would live. And the fourth pillar is where something like the monkey king would live. And they're all interconnected based on um, their level of practices and engagement. So we're actually weaving this huge tapestry, bringing everything that's under, fallen under wuxia in a connect, interconnected world. And this year, this past year, we've basically developed four flagship titles that each represent one of these uh, sectors. And I'm gonna go into it a little bit more. I've, I've also prepared some brand new artwork which has never been seen before. This is our first title called The Adept. Um, this became one of the best single issue, um, single issue comics ever on Kickstarter. I think we landed in the 0.01 percentile in terms of performance. So this became an instant seller. This is a young woman um, becoming the hero of, becoming the hero that she didn't think she was capable of. And this became a very popular series. Um, I'll share it within this room today. We just, um, I'm not gonna name any names, but we just got our first major movie offer on this, this adaptation. I didn't, I didn't expect it to happen so quickly, but, but things are coming together fairly quickly now. This is the storytelling of the adept. Um, one of the things that we really believe in the adept is bringing together, bringing to the forefront the tradition of Shaolin, which is the, the, the original founding mythology of tran transcendent kung fu. So there's a lot of... Um, opportunities for, for um, mental wellness. Anyways, it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really great great story. We're very excited about it. And you can see there's all kinds of amazing action. We actually hired a real action choreographer so, so that everything that happens on our screen is authentic and real. And that we found in, in our very early rollout, um, Martial artists really love what we do because they see that we're really dedicating to a lot of authenticity in everything that we do. This is the, this is the cover of the second ad up. We just closed our, our, our most recent campaign. This is a great cover art by, done by one of the best comic artists today, Jean Han. I really, really love this piece. These are all becoming collectibles, by the way. This is the book that I wrote called Chronicles of the Immortal Swordsman, which is... Um, my favorite novel that my father wrote growing up. So I basically took it out of the ancient mountains of China and I chose LA, modern LA, as the backdrop. This is how it's coming across in, in, in the comic medium. I expect this to be hitting the, next, the big screen next as well. These are some of the amazing covers that we've worked on. These are some of the key art for in designing this universe. And this, this next project is called, in Chinese, it's called Gan Shi Jiu Mei. Gan Shi Jiu Mei is, has been a seminal project that my father wrote. It's actually been made into television four times in Asia. Once in Taiwan, once in Hong Kong, and twice in mainland China. So this is one of those, in, in, traveling, in, traveling, in traveling to China through multiple um, times, I've, 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 I've discovered about half of all Chinese people have seen a version of this somewhere. So we're now adapting Gan uh, Jiu Mei. We're calling it Assassin G. It's going to be it's going to be it's going to be launched sometime this summer. Uh, and this is this is the 
the teacher of Amy from The Adept, and he gets his own book. And Fa Sheng is, um, it's a very, very important story of, anyways, I, I won't get into it. You guys could just see the visual. Now, I do have a question, yes. because you were telling me that you might have a surprise for our audience. Tell me more about that. Which surprise? Well, there are a couple of surprises. Yes. Several of them are good. But I was specifically thinking of the surprise of the artwork. Yes. So um, this is a really special occasion for us, because I don't get, I don't, I've been just hibernating, working so hard. And this is kind of our first coming out party. Every, everything else has been done virtually. So I've actually brought um, our first issue comic book of The Adept. This is a collector's item. And I've signed, I've signed about a handful of copies, not a handful, about, I signed all the um, single issue copies of the Adept and it's waiting for you guys at the backstage. So later, you guys have an opportunity to basically um, be given a, a copy of the Adept, an autographed version of the Adept. <laughs> but but there's, there, there, there's, also an, there's also an ask that, uh, in exchange, I would like to ask you to follow our, our Instagram account. What's the Instagram handle? Instagram account is, is called Immortal Wuxia. So Immortal Wuxia, all you need to do, go back there and show Anne that you, you have found our Instagram page, you followed it, and then she'll give you a copy of the, of the Adept. We only have like 100 more of these left, by the way. Very cool. All right, now that they know what's, uh, what they've got waiting for so them, this is tell So this is Assassin G, and this is what the key art in China look like. And this is, we're developing a lot of modern takes on it. These are, these are, these are the, the newest images that we're sharing from this universe. So this is kind of the behind the scenes work of yeah, putting this I've, whole story. I've never seen together. any of these before, so they must be relatively new. Yes, they are. So ultimately, what does it mean? We're developing, basically, um, we're looking to develop about five to 10 titles every year, and eventually they do come together in this major event in our storyverse called The Reckoning, where it's global destruction, and then it's up to the heroes to really decide what to do with, um, what are the next steps, and, and this actually parallels, I think, a, a moment of reckoning that we're facing in our world, and it's very, very real for us. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a matter of war and peace or, or, or the environment. So those kind of threats are very much part of the immortal story verse. And we're actively thinking about what is it going to take for us to transition to the next part. And I believe Wuxia and our story verse and the characters and the journeys they go on and the changes that they go on are symbolic of what could happen next. So this is a part of... Um, the technology part of it. So in creating, I think the Hollywood part of it or the creative part of it or the inspirational part of the story, was, I hope it's evident, you know, that's really what sto Hollywood is known for. Great storytelling, compelling characters, stories that could travel and arcs that really make sense, packaging, aesthetics, visuals. And this is, the, the next part of this is how can we build a, um, a studio that actually knows something? Yeah. And one of the things that we really settled on was the idea of the MVP, which is we're in the middle of doing. I would say that we've already learned so much from our users. And all of our stories have, are constantly being updated every day. Our writers and our artists are at work. They're looking at data. They're looking at different statistically significant cohorts who are giving us a lot of intelligence about what they like, who they are, and why they like it. So this, this is, is off electronic graphic novels. Yes. Mm. And also, also um, focus groups interacting with our content. So we actually conduct a lot of our own focus groups and also the fan engagement part of it. This is, the, um, this is our first crowdfunding campaign that basically uh, we raised, we raised a, a good amount of money, but I'm really proud of the fact that we, we got over close to 600 investors who joined in on this journey with us without seeing um, our content. And this is kind of our roadmap over the next several, several years. Um, we're in the middle of 2022. The titles to the right are our catalog uh, titles. And I'm really happy to share 
for the first time that we actually are in the process of looking at artificial intelligence as a way to, to glean and galvanize and putting together our Storyverse uh, titles. This is the IP engine of how our various ecosystems work together. I don't want to get into it. And this is basically our product roadmap. We're, in the, we're running a three-year cycle, and our goal, and I could, I could say with some confidence, by the, year of, by the end of next year, we will have our, um, our premium content studio up and running. Like I said, we just got our first movie offer. Um, we expect the immortal, serve, the immortal subscription service to be launched by, by, by the end of this year. And the new exciting development is that we're about to go into the meta, well, you know, there's so many different catchwords, but we actually have all the core ingredients to be a dominant player in the NFT world by virtue of the things that I've shared um, and that our new kind of um, leg to this, to this table will be the NFT engagement that um, we'll be launching by, by the end of the second quarter. Thank you. That's kind of um... so. Pe so Peter, uh, incredible to to see a what you're doing with your father's legacy. You are the hero who has sort of been called to serve and are are going ahead and you're building. You're adding the powers that you need in order to succeed. Um, there was another great bit of news that you said, you told me earlier today, you would be able to let people know about. Yes. So why don't you share that news as well? So um, when everybody thinks about comic, comics, you know, the Comic-Con comes up as, a, as, as kind of the grand poobah of where global pop, pop culture is minted, created, and proliferated. We just got the invitation by Comic-Con uh, about a, a week ago. So we're going to the big stage. Uh, I'll be unveiling our, our, um, our story verse for the first time in two and a half weeks in Comic-Con, and we'll be making some really big announcements this year in Comic-Con where we'll, we'll have a global stage. So this little garage venture is just about to kind of hit the big leagues. So it's, it's, it's really an exciting moment. Well, that is absolutely fantastic. Now that we've given everyone the overview, we're going to want to bring people in the audience into the conversation. So the way we're going to do it is we, in fact, have microphones you see at the back. So you please do not ask the question until you have the microphone so this can be heard by all the people to whom this is live streaming around the world. Uh, if you have a question that you want to ask Peter, or God forbid me, you can sort of line up and come. Let's, why don't we have people come towards the front of the room so that it would be a little easier for Peter to see them as well. And anyone who wants to can just go ahead. You don't have to raise your hand. Just go ahead, walk over there, take the microphone. You hey, can be Peter. the hero. How are you? Hey. Uh, question for you. How do you price your product? How do I, how price. Do I price how my product? How do you price your product? That's a really, really good question. It really depends what kind of product. On the subscription side, we actually have four tiers. So that um, we're basically creating four different windows where people can sample our comics. The first window will be directly through our subscription service, and that's on a monthly fee, so it's going to be unlimited. The second window is an activation window on Kickstarter. and This is a premium window where fans and collectors will overpay. So on average, we're getting about $35 per 44-page title. So that's really, but that's a, collector, that's a collector's tier. And the third tier is when our comic books are sold in comic stores and graphic novels, and then the, the price points will be about a third of the second tier. But the numbers will be greater. And the fourth tier is, is a revenue share uh, with various aggregators like Comixology or Webtoons. So that's really a, a rev share model. So it's, there isn't a one price fit all approach to our comic business. And I'm really proud of our innovation because this, this kind of approach has never happened in the comic business. May I just follow up? Um, it's more about how did you decide that $35? Are you compare with your potential com competitors, or is this the cost model? Um, that is the amalgamated average we, we, we received. So part of what we do for Kickstarter, we actually design 20, about 20 different tiers of collectibles. So somebody can get, pay $5 for a digital download or pay $1,000 to, to meet the different creators and the writers. But on average, we found that 
the average person will spend $35. So that's, 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 that's an average. Very cool. Yeah. Over in front here. Hi. Uh, you do know you're uniquely qualified for the world of NFTs. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, it, was, it, was, it, it got a little bit embarrassing because everywhere I went, it's like, are you going to the NFTs? Are you going? You really should be. I resisted it because I, I feel that I, I still do that the NFT space, there's, there's been a lot of perils. It's very, there's been a lot of troubling activities. But ultimately, I just, when I really, I took, a, I took about a month to really study NFTs. I read up and everything. I, I watched everything. I read everything. I finally said, hey, I, I really understand it now. It's really not about the digital art. It's about digital ownership. It's about having this technology platform. Because part of running what we call a radical fan engagement system is that we realize there, there aren't really good tech platforms to meet the, the various machinations of, of, of a very uh, multifaceted real-time engagements that we want with our users. And when I looked at NFTs and the way that the smart contracts and the, the, under, the technological underpinning, uh, the collectible aspects, well, I, I said, well, this is, this is actually the technology built for the future of subscription. So we're not really thinking about it as a traditional art collection business, but this is a passport into, into the immortal universe. And my goal as a creator is ultimately co-create with as many users as possible. So NFTs has really, you know, so once I got that understanding, the NFT, NFT part was really easy. And I do expect we're going to sell out. Especially if those NFTs will continue to be your key to accessing every element of the immortal story verse, including eventually Immortal Land, which I assume you right. picked out some location in Southern No, California. no, no, look, so there's gonna be, um, I think there's a, there's a unique opening right now for our niche of the universe. There isn't a Eastern fantasy oriented um, world out there. And I think um, because we're not a play, we're not a flash in the pan, we're also very ensconced in the traditional entertainment world where NFTs ultimately will have to travel to. And I think this is where the, you know, that moat will be very destructive for a lot of the NFT folks now. But that's not a, an issue for us. So we're really thoughtfully engaging it. And um, in fact, one of, one of our advisors, uh, Mark Young, has been the guy whispering in my ear on all things related to NFTs. And also, um, Jonathan. Awesome. I can just Next question. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Preeti. I, I have a two-part question, part one for you and part, part two for you, Chris. Okay. Uh, so part eight, and congrats on the initial success with all the Kickstarter campaigns for the, uh, for the books. My question is, with media being so prolific across so many different mediums, like is that Netflix, Apple TV, normal te television, so many mediums, and the movie theaters, what would you consider as the top metrics of success, say like three to five years from now? That's part A. Part B is, if we apply blitzscaling to this, what would it mean? Very good. That's a very good question. And um, to, be, to be candid, I, it's, a, it's a question we're still trying to ask right now because it's such a fragmented marketplace right now. And, um, and, the, and the competitive pressures are growing by the day, so I can't, I can't really tell you because we're dealing with, and what, what I've learned is that um, consumers have different preferences. Your cust like our customers, we have, we have customers who love what we do, but they're mutually exclusive right now. They're all living in different, dif different platforms and different silos. Even in social media, first I thought when I got started, I thought, oh, okay, they're, they're primary windows. But even in social media, some people prefer to connect us through LinkedIn, believe it or not. Or they would like to, or a, a type of person, martial artists like to connect with us on Instagram. Comic book people prefer Twitter. So there's so many different fragmentations. So right now we're kind of piecing the pie together and addressing them differently and collectively together. So we're still experimenting. I expect all of that to change when we go into um, traditional entertainment, such as movies and television. And I think that'll be a moment where we're going to be able to see a lot more aggregation. But until then, we're ready to, to kind of treat the, the fragmented marketplace in a very fragmented way. 
And as for the question about blitz scaling, I'll provide the quick definition for anyone who has not read the book, which is the pursuit of rapid growth or speed by prioritizing speed over efficiency in the face of uncertainty. So in thinking about blitz scaling and how it applies to Immortal Studios, and I should probably disclose that I am an investor in Immortal Studios and Peter. Uh, probably should have mentioned that up front, but people probably guessed that. Uh, anyways, the way that blitz scaling really applies is twofold. One is just in the techniques that Peter's been using. So if you think about the use of the comic book as the MVP, that was one of the things that really caught my attention. Right? It allows him to move so much faster than the other players in the marketplace. If he started off just trying to, let, let's just license movie properties, uh, you know, the cycle for learning on that is really long. But the cycle for learning on the comic books, and perhaps even someday web comics, things being delivered real time, is really short, allows Immortal to move much, much faster. So that was one of the things that impressed me when Peter told me about it. By the way, Chris, I have to also disclose that I, I am a, an alumnus, alumni of, of the Blitzscale Academy, because in getting ready to go, to go broad and in, into uh, the world of crowd engagements, I actually took his online course and, and I, I read the book and I was like, yes, this is, this is a version of what we want to do. So, I'm, you know, I actually watched, got to know Chris's work and I'm so happy we're sitting on the stage together. Yeah, and then Peter reached out to me and I was like, oh, what, this is one of my students? Let me talk to him. The other thing is, just in thinking about it, part of what powers blitz scaling is when there is some sort of reason why market leadership confers some sort of competitive advantage. And we can see this play out. Probably the best company to look at this is Disney, because Disney is the most successful entertainment company in the world, bar none. And it is successful because it does a couple of things very well. The first, and this is why it's so near and dear to my heart when you talk about engagement, is it engages people. Right? Disney content is basically more engaging in the sense, I mean, it's better in most cases, but it's more engaging in the sense that Disney absolutely encourages the fans to build a community, to interact with each other. Right? This is why Disney has theme parks, not just for the sake of charging us absurd amounts of money to go to them, but because it creates a community. It creates this incredible bond. And Disney, unlike certain other entertainment companies, does not step in when bloggers and YouTubers talk about it. They want that community. The bigger the community, the more attractive it becomes. Imagine if Disney were a tiny little niche product, people wouldn't be as excited to consume the products. They consume it because they know they're part of something bigger. And then Disney also turns around and is really good at investing as a way of competitive differentiation. If you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland, you've seen how they handle things versus how they handle it at any other theme park. The amount of investment that goes into the individual rides and the individual experiences is at least double, perhaps triple or more at Disney than any other place. But they are able to do that because they know that that overinvestment confers a lasting competitive advantage, which is why Disney is now one of the most valuable companies in the world, why Disney Plus, which people are like, how could they ever catch up with Netflix? They're at like 170 million users now. They're where they, they had five-year projections saying maybe we'll get to 100 million. They got there in a year and a half. So Disney is sort of the example, the model for how you can do this successfully. Obviously, they have a lot of resources, but let's not forget, Walt Disney started things off as just a humble animator with a small studio and built things up from there, and that's what I'm looking forward to seeing from Peter. Thank you. And by the way, I think in talking about Disney, that Disney is ultimately a very centralized apparatus, yeah. right? And we're, we're now in the, in the Web3 world where I consider us a Web3 company because philosophically we're very much into a decentralized approach and by dealing with the public. And I think this is where we're di very different. I sit down with, with our senior executives who come from top management at Disney and Marvel and DC and that they've always dealt with IP with, um, with an ironclad hand. They, they, in as much as they want to interact with the crowd, they were never willing to see the level of control or ownership. And we're basically changing that dynamic. We want people to benefit economically and socially from their engagements. We want to empower the masses, and so we are a subversive player. So I think the next chapter is going to be written. So I consider Immortal to be a Web3 uh, entertainment studio. And, and the opportunity is to write the next chapter. And I don't, nobody knows how it's going to turn out. Uh, copy. Excellent. Yes. Howdy. Uh, Peter, Chris, thank you guys very much for your time. Um, personally, this is quite inspiring because when you explain the story as being an immigrant into this new country and just fighting on your all to make it happen, 
not really resonating. Can you speak it? Uh, oh, can, yeah. is, is this better now? Yes. Yeah, no. you're, you're keeping it very cool, very low key. Oh. Like Fonzie, well, but no. I guess. Lean into it. Uh, I was going to say thank you for sharing your story and thank you for sharing uh, the inspiration behind this because being an immigrant um, and also being uh, an American Chinese, this is something that uh, feels really home. Um, the question that I had was twofold. One, uh, you mentioned about distribution has been a, a core rate limiter historically within entertainment. Um, how are you thinking about distribution for uh, Immortal Studios? And then furthermore, what? Immortal Studios. Mm -hmm. And then furthermore, you mentioned the component of creating um, joint stake ownership and aligned incentives across your crowdsource stakeholders. Um, how are you thinking about that? Um, distribution is by whatever means necessary because it's such a fragmented marketplace. There's things that we feel very strong that we, we should do, which is direct distribution. So we're always going to um, have a lot of focus on our own subscription service where our fans can, be, can receive direct distribution. So that's the part of the business that we're building. But that is not everybody. So in as much as you can get our content directly through us, this is, it's almost like your favorite consumer product. That you, can, you can buy it directly from the creator. You can, go to Nordstrom's rack. you can go to Nordstrom's Rack if you want to get it discounted, but two years down the line, or you want to go to a premier, premier venue to get it at a different window. So for ultim ultimately, we've created a, a multifaceted uh, distribution service um, across all of our products. So. It's, it's pretty pragmatic. But when it gets into um, bigger ticketed content, such as movies and television shows, we expect those content to be behind paid walls, such as Netflix or, or Amazon, uh, different subscription services. So, so we, we expect some of those to be behind uh, paid walls. In terms of, we're kind of also taking the same approach with, uh, with audience engagement and participation. There's some people who would like to be shareholders. So through WeFunder and through public platforms, I love the fact that we have people who invested $100. And, and they're, you know, they're really, really enjoying the ride. Or then, but then there are others who are, want to collect through Kickstarter, so they have the opportunity to do that. Now through NFTs, we're creating a, a unique sliver for what I call the, um, the crypto ninjas of the world to also participate. Again, uh, what I've found is that Consumers actually have different preferences right now. So for our job is to meet them where they're at right now. No, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, the other question I had was, it seems like the core outcome and goal of Immortal Studios is to help provide a paradigm that people can aspire to in terms of uplifting their capabilities, uplifting their courage, frankly, from a societal and personal standpoint. Um, I love data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think uh, I'm curious, how are you thinking about, I know this is quite qualitative by nature, but like, are there certain paradigms you have for thinking about assessing um, the impact of said work and then assessing how to assess, well, assessing how the content produced is implicating and impacting that said outcome? Like Boy, that's that. a that's a that's a really really great question, and I think I'll try to answer it in this way. You know, and kind of in dealing with the, the 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 institutional investors of the world, everybody wants to know what problem we're solving. And you know, I've, the answer that I've always wanted to give that I haven't yet is is a is a, is a problem of consciousness. You know, it's a really really big problem right now, and consciousness is something that is basically it's our level of awareness. The awareness of the average person right now is very, very downtrodden. It's a very, very confusing, challenging, difficult, difficult time for, for the average person. And if you think about it, where else can you get some kind of spiritual or conscious comfort? Because it's no longer organized religion. It's not corporations. It's not politics. You know, where is it going to come from? Where is that special safe place? And I think one of the safe the, the safest places, one of the only places right now is between you and your preferred storytelling or your device. So I treat those two hours or flipping through the pages as really, really valuable. So we try to pack as much in it as possible. Um, 
I've had the benefit of working in, in uh, the MIT Media Lab where I actually looked at brain science and sweet spots. So um, we expect to be a very dominant player in the world of trans tech once we're out into the movie making world. So there's music, there's vibrations, there's sounds, there's colors. There's things that we already know that actually induce higher states of awareness where love, gratitude, appreciation, forgiveness, breakthroughs happen. So I kind of think of our storytelling as can we offer the subjective emotional environments to take somebody there and transform them by virtue of what happen, how they interact with the storytelling. Now, I don't have a way of measuring that just yet, but I think we're about to. Hmm. And if you, there, there, there are probably folks in this audience right now who are working with various biofeedback, they're working with transformational technologies. I see us as being a really powerful partner for them because they don't have the emotional piece, they don't have the, the gateway, they don't have the reason for someone to sit down and care where storytelling and the characters we create will. So I look forward to the day where we could actually say, yes, uh, this person came in at a, at a beta level of consciousness. By the time they watched this film, they read this thing, and they played this game, they're now in theta. And we helped them overcome a major crisis or, or, or an aspect of their life. And this is actually true to the wuxia genre, because this is what happens to these heroes. So I don't know how to answer it, but I, that's the direction that we're going in. And, and I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to measure it somehow. Awesome, thank you. And by the way, I always think Peter's very stylish. This guy's got the outfit of the night. You gotta turn around and show people the scarf, the ensemble, it's incredible. Look at that. Awesome, next question. Um, well, we gotta go, we gotta give other people yeah, a chance yeah. to. Thank you, just, you got yourself a massive fan. That's all I gotta say. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Mortal Studios seems to have a really awesome uh, vision and it, a, it seems like a very exciting place to uh, uh, work. Um, so I know you mentioned that a lot of your disillusion with mainstream Hollywood came from the lack of diversity. However, oftentimes mainstream Hollywood has to remove diversity and gender or sexual orientation in order to reach Chinese markets. How do you kind of... You mean Chinese? You said Chinese? PRC market? markets, he means. Oh, PRC markets, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you for the correction. Um, Is that true, though? Yes, yes, absolutely. That, that Hollywood has to, in order to reach the Chinese market, you said? Yes. To are, be you talking, are you talking about editing political content or? Um, I meant diversity and sexual orientation or genders. OK, that's one aspect of yes. diversity, but not writ large. Yes. But I guess, um, how do you uh, manage to like, work the line between those needs as well as the want for diversification from what I assume is a younger market? Um, so first of all, it's not my goal to meet the requirements of the Chinese government in our, in our content. That's not part of uh, why we exist. Um, but as a secondary issue, I've, I'm actually pretty seasoned in, in dealing with um, the ins and outs of negotiating for uh, Chinese market access. So it's, it's something that I'm carefully monitoring. But I'm really thinking about the Chinese market for three years from now, four years from now. And as a, as a pretty avid China watcher, I believe China's on the press. I mean, it's, it could go either way. It could go either way. So uh, our view is that we're not going to, to lean into this political moment, but we're going to make a stand with the values that we believe in. Um, and, and I think the Chinese consumers are going to stand with us when, when they're given the chance to. OK, awesome. Yeah. Thank you again. Hey, Peter. Uh, great talk. Uh, Chris. Um, amazing moderating on this topic. So I just wanted to take a broader question for a second. Um, I understand that you're bringing this East Asian perspective and philosophy and history and culture to the broader global community. And as you mentioned, 60%. Which, by the way, I think is that the apex of global pop culture. Because the, the conversation everywhere you go, what is yoga? What is, where is Qigong? Where is Tai Chi? These are the kind of catchwords that seems to be everywhere. So what I wanted to ask you, for being South Asian, um, and as you mentioned, Asia is 60% of the world's population. This device these days has kind of globalized culture amongst Gen Zs, um, and it's amazing how aware they are of what's going on in the world. Uh, are there lessons to be learned from 
the proliferation of Bollywood around the world, except for in the US, but everywhere else in the world you go, people are aware of this media. And you know, as Indian culture is starting to yeah. you know, permeate everywhere, and, mm -hmm. and you see this with the food and the cultural awareness, which wasn't there when I grew up, but nowadays it's, it's permeating all different cultures and backgrounds. How do you see there's some way to like also you know, bring about the, um, the richness of the Chinese culture through your art form to the global mass audience? Um, I, think, I think there's a, there's a lot going on in, in your comments. So uh, first of all, I think, I think a lot of these Chinese ideas are already mainstream. It's already, it's already happening, but we are not, um, in as much as Wuxiad is a product of, of, of China specifically, it's also, it's also a big part of the, um, it's a shared tradition, frankly, between India and, and, and China, and we do pay homage to that. Some of the, the visuals that I clicked through, there is an Indian gentleman that's very prominently, his name is Bodhi Dharma, who is an Indian monk who, who actually traveled from India to China, and he helped co-found the Shaolin Temple and created the original myth of Kung Fu. So the original myth of Kung Fu actually is a hybrid between India and China. As someone who is deeply devoted to Vedic uh, philosophy, is that um, a lot of the Vedic ideals are very much represented in our story verse. So I don't, I don't consider this lineage separate from South Asians. And so a lot of those characters and those um, philosophies are going to have a very um, prominent representation in, in our so I didn't mean that that's separate. What I meant was like, how can we help proliferate this, um, the understanding of East Asian culture and philosophy that exists, where it intersects with South Asian, that's, that's a yeah. given because of proximity, but to the broader masses of the world, to, to the African content, to the Middle East content, to Europe, to like the, to the Americas. How do we, is there some lesson there? That's why I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, I, th I think um, because we are showing up in the world not as a, um, cultural lesson, not as a museum exhibit, not as high art. We deal in popular culture. So popular culture, the nature of popular culture is that it travels virally. It, it's, it's imagery, it, it's faces, it's storytelling that's very, very easy. So I would say just by, um, by showing up and telling the stories that we, we are telling in, in the way that uh, the average consumer, in the way they want to interact with the stories, that changes the, the narrative already. The fact that we even exist as a company, and um, God willing, we continue to succeed, the stories that are going to be out there will be, will be the agents and the ambassadors, one story at a time. We take that pretty seriously. And for every one of our stories, we actually think about psychographics. We think about how are we breaking new ground? How are we speaking to very, very unique, underrepresented voices and, and points of view? Um, so, one story at a time. <laughs> Thank you. Tim, I think this may need to be our last question because we're almost out of time. Okay, this is a question for both Peter um, and Chris. And um, earlier you had mentioned this motto or tagline um, about your own adventure. You have to be your own hero of your own adventure. What is the biggest, if you each were in your own production, what is the biggest act you've had to do of heroism in your own life to overcome? What's the biggest demon or obstacle you've had to slay in your own life to become the men you are today? Wow, that's a good question. Now, one of the things I tell people sometimes is that for better or worse, I've not had to overcome huge amounts of adversity in my life. When I went on television, I was on a game show called Mental Samurai. They kept asking me, talk about the challenges. I'm like, okay, uh, how about if I was bullied when I was in middle school? Is that good? Will that work for you guys? So I will struggle a little bit with this. But I do have this philosophy, and my philosophy is that there are decisive moments that occur in our lifetime, much like there would be in a movie, like the, the point at which everything hinges or turns. And there are times in my life when I can point to that and say, I made decision A rather than decision B. And it set me down a different path. Uh, the path that brought me to the stage tonight, there were a couple of different ones. Probably the most proximate one was uh, a moment when my friends Ben Kaznoka and Reed Hoffman asked me to come and, and see them. And they said, hey, we're interested in working on more books, and would you be willing to join us? And I said, well, you know, that depends. Does my name appear on what we write? And of course it does. I'm like, OK, I'm in. Right? That's a moment where I can see my life was going down one path, and it suddenly diverged and took a different path. 
But it is really important to recognize when one of those decisive moments comes. It's not always obvious, but if you're looking for them, if you're anticipating them, if you know that there are moments in which your life can change, then you're more likely to recognize when it happens and hopefully be ready to make the decision. Thank you. <laughs> You know, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you know, I feel like there's, there's like a big fight. There's an internal battle to win almost every week. And, and if you're dealing with it at that week, it just feels like the, the, the thing that if it doesn't work out can literally destroy you. But I would say a, sem a defining moment for me was when I decided that I was actually going to be an entrepreneur. That I was going to live and die by the choices that I made. And that I was going to make it happen. And I would say um, it's taken me 20 years to get to this point, to kind of eventually create this company. So I would say uh, Immortal continues to be that, that defining challenge and because it has such a big mission that I, I don't think it's just about me. It's like, can, can we actually create a new global mythology uh, that picks up where Marvel has kind of left off? And it's something that we're deeply committed to. Can, and can this story verse truly transform the world for the positive? I don't know, but that's the collective commitment the Immortal team has made. So to really show up for that every day and really own it and believe it is, um, it's a very, very challenging thing to do. And for, as a person, I think um, it's always dealing with the um, thoughts of negation in my own mind. Like, who are you to, to think you could actually do this? You know, who do you think you are that you could, you know, so it's, it's those kind of voices. Um, even as a, as, a, as a son of an artist, my dad actually did not encourage me to go into the entertainment industry. His, his goal for me was to be a, um, was to be a employee of a very secure, stable, you know, company. So eschewing all those comforts and of security has always been, you know, staying true and suffering the consequences. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> All right, so, couple of, final, couple of final notes. If people were interested in supporting you, it sounded like you had run some campaigns for people who could become investors. I heard $100. Are any of those still going on, or how can people support what you're doing? Um, we don't have a public campaign right now, so for those of you who are smaller cap investors, I would say, please, please uh, if you follow us on social, you'll be notified of the next time we open it up. Um, I, I would imagine it would be sometime in the next, um, in the next nine months or so. Um, we're finishing our, our pre-seed round right now. We are about 90% coverage for those of you who are actually interested in getting involved as accredited Christmas, investors. As accredited investors, so this is not a this is not a pitch unless if you are accredited. Um, come and talk. To, <laughs> come and talk to me. Awesome. And then finally, we still I, I think we still have copies of Adept. If people wanted to come up and take a picture with you, would you be open to having a few selfies? Of course. Excellent. You heard it. Hold them to so, his promise. So, so everybody, for those of you who, do, who, who are interested in the, the adept, Anna, can you stand up and wave around? There you go. We have copies of the adept. Or oh, I think we still do. People have been going back. They wanted to make sure they got some along the way. Oh, OK. So anyway, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the first one that's starting, that's starting the story first. And it makes me really feel good that you guys will be able to walk home with a little bit of our work. Excellent. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you to Hannah House for hosting this incredible event. We'll be sticking around a bit so you can get all the photos you want with Peter and his amazing hat. And uh, I just encourage everyone to hang out for a little bit, and we'll just stay and take questions and, until they kick us out. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs>